Could you please pronounce your name correctly for me? My name is Harry Taylor, a.k.a. Fly is my longtime nickname. Some people call me. And the first thing I generally want to know about people is how they became creative. So childhood, were your parents creative? Was there some great teacher? Like, how did you even get to being creative? I have no uh, serious answer to that other than, you know, I was always drawing, always painting as a kid. Always, that was just, my place was just drawing. I was, I, tons of sketchbooks. My, my kids do that today. Same kind of thing. And then there, there became a time, probably late high school, that I noticed my, my paintings and my drawings, you know, things weren't improving. They were taking longer. I was trying harder, but nothing was going well. And then I was doing a lot of skateboarding at the time as well. And then I started borrowing my dad's camera and photographing the skateboard action and uh, friends and things. And then that was getting to be pretty exciting. And went to Paris on a school trip and took my dad's camera. And I remember photographing this girl who was selling crepes on the street. I was so excited. Couldn't wait to see my film. Of course, it didn't come out. It was, you know, it's the photographer's you know, sweet misery is that image you didn't get, you know, that's, that's always, you never, you don't forget those for sure. Went to uh, Chowan College for a two-year program in photography, and it was pretty great. It was very technical and went through that and, and finally got interested in school in general, and which hadn't happened until that point. Then just kept growing. And, you know, I always had the philosophy that, that fine art and commercial art should be very closely related because uh, I think really outstanding commercial art could be fine art just as easily. It could hang on the wall if it's well done. And that's an excellent place to start with this because you primarily, to make a living, do commercial work, mostly sort of architectural real estate kind of stuff, which I've seen for many years and I thoroughly enjoy, though it's not my medium. And then on the other side, you also do these fine art pieces, which I've seen at the Cameron Art Museum. I think you had an exhibition. Mm hmm and you currently do these uh, alternative processes. What, what's the or historical process? Like, what's the word people are using these days? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's all over the place. I, I know people call it, when I, when I was in college in the 80s and 90s, it was alternative processes, but you kind of say, well, alternative to what? You know, what does that mean? It was a comment Mark Osterman gave, uh, which I thought was right on. It's um, true. I mean, yeah, it's like, what, what, what in the world? But, I mean, historical makes sense. Like, yeah, it, yeah. I, I call it antique processes. Okay, antique processes. And, and, it, and it comes from my interest as a child, seeing my parents were antique dealers, and we always had antiques coming and going, and there were always a big pile of tintypes and union cases around of stuff. And there was a, a treasured tintype of our ancestor who was a Civil War soldier that, that only certain family members could copy and have a copy of it. But the original one is still MIA. But I do have a nice copy of it. I think it is in the Charleston region, so I, I plan to go investigate that one of these days. I can get in touch with those relatives. But um, I'd like to make a better copy. It, it goes way back for, for me and that stuff. And then there just came a day after my mother passed away that, you know, it, it's a catalyst for change when you live, lose a close family member. And I went on to learn uh, wet plate collodion and tintypes, ambrotypes, and, and negatives and and that's been my, my primary medium for about the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years. Sounds about right. I remember when you started investigating it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, when you first, back then, when you first investigated, it was like everything. The cameras are different. The chemicals sound terrible. You know, it's just, the whole thing is very daunting. And it, it probably took me two years to, to make the first one. I've seen it. And I've been to workshops where people are doing it and stuff. And I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty standard sort of historical kind of yeah. stuff i mean it, it's not rocket science it mm -hmm. once you sort of learn once you learn how to do a tin type it, you know moving over to a wet plate or anything like this is pretty similar i mean the chemicals are a little different the mediums are a little different but the, yeah. the processes are pretty it's darn about close. the same you got once you got a tin type you've got ambro type you've got collodion negatives and all that so i dream someday of daguerreotypes i would love to learn how to do a daguerreotype Ugh. So well, beautiful. I've, I've done them. It's extremely expensive. Oh, yeah. Silver, and, and mercury. Unless you're doing mercury, like... it's, it's not worth doing. The back rail's not, not so hot. But, 
Yeah, that is by far the most beautiful. Like Jerry Spagnoli's work is just oh yeah off the chart. I love it. I mean, I've so always spectacular. I collect them if I could ever see. Well, I collected. I should rephrase. I collected them when they were affordable to collect. Now they're now everybody's collecting them and they're very expensive now. But I remember being able to buy them for ten dollars, fifteen dollars. Yeah. Like, and it was great. Yeah. Now if you find one under twenty five, thirty, that's that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I mean the ones I've been seeing around hundreds. Are, yeah, fifty to hundred kind of range, and I'm just like, ugh, I'm not I had a lady come in a couple of years ago and she had five or six whole plate daguerre or daguerreotypes wow they were colored they, they were spectacular i've i've never seen anything like it and, and I, she was asking what museum to put them in i assume well what to do with them and i i just kind of resealed them kind of dusted them out resealed them and gave them back to her scanned them and do daguerreotypes scan yeah really yeah nice okay didn't yeah. know that yeah. All right, so let's get a little bit into it. So okay. you are, as I said, sort of my working knowledge of you, which please educate me because I haven't literally seen you probably in 10 years. It's been a while, yeah. Is that you're primarily a commercial sort of real estate architectural photographer, and that's how you make your living. That's really like your primary, I'll call it like your reputation is built on that as far as income and all this kind of stuff. And then for your own edifice and your own pleasure and your own interest, you do these tin types and ember types and so on um so how do you balance all that because i mean i'm sure you have invested a lot of money and time in both of these things i mean more or less you're having to have two almost well probably more than full-time jobs just to be able to make ends meet because of course you're falling into that system of the gig economy so it's not reliable incomes it's not you don't get health care you don't get vacation time like so like there's that extra amount of work in there so how is that working for you, you know, in 2020? 2020, man, what a year. If it was only a pandemic or only a recession or only an election, it, things would be kind of simple. But we get this perfect s storm of mess. It's been really difficult. I mean, every year, every year it's really difficult in the gig economy. I mean, I, it's never quite come easy to me because I'm sort of a introverted person and the world kind of favors a loud mouth and I'm kind of like disappearing into the shadow doing my thing. And I mean, you know, I wish if I, if I had a trust fund and I was a billionaire, I would, I'd be probably doing the same thing. I would just, I mean, I, I, I like, I do probably, I don't know, several thousand headshots a year. I never really count, but it's a, it's a lot. And so wait, several he thousand headshots. That would be like four a day. I guess maybe it's not that. Maybe it's exaggeration. Several okay. hundred a year. Okay. Yeah, well, I know it's 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 in the four to five hundred a year easily. Are there that many actors and people that need? Well, no, it's not actors. It's more corporate stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a number of companies that I work with and go all over and 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 sometimes it's twenty five or thirty people in a day. And, okay, that makes a lot more sense because yeah. I'm thinking like an actor headshot, no, like that no. could take an hour to get. Like I think like corporate headshots. Got yeah. it. Yeah, and. So there's that, and you know, and I'm always trying to perfect that, trying to do that better, you know. And then, but then there's my my curiosities with with wet plate and and my artwork, and I I generally have a, a you know a historical connection to different things, you know, like the Cameron Art Museum. I did a build a glass house of glass negatives and amber types of related Civil War imagery of little tableaus of things that happened or might have happened around Wilmington and. I, it was very funny. A lot of there, there were several comments where people asked me, "Wow, where did you find these?" You know, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you didn't find them. You didn't produced find them. them. You find them. Yeah, yeah. We, we channeled them. We, we we pulled the mystery out. Of, we pulled the. I like to think we pulled the history out of the land and created recreated things that had happened. Well, and you've also done stuff with uh, like the marshlands and also surfers, like see these kinds of sort of. Yeah, the Cape Fear River is a big, huge thing to me. I just find it endlessly interesting. And then, and of course, there's environmental precedent about that too, with the pollution and and all the things that are floating in the river. But the history, you know, one of the earliest Spanish explorers came up the river and lost a ship, and then I don't know, there's just en endless stories of the river. And you go out there today, it's many places look probably about the same as they did then, aside from, you know, there's dredge islands or occasional cargo ship passes by, container ship goes by, 
but and otherwise pollution yeah pollution and mcmansions and things but many places it still looks the same and i think there's there's a lot of mystery when i'm out there the one thing that i'm most sort of uh, want to hear about from your perspective which is like i have an opinion on this but of course i don't do it so this is what i want to hear your experiences about is you you sort of have two careers like so you have a fine art photography which is mm -hmm. what i call your tin types mm -hmm. and your historical processes and then you have your commercial photography how easy and or difficult is that to balance because i mean certain people know you for your architectural work and certain people and your headshots and certain people know you for your historical processes but i mean you sort of almost like does it does it help your either of them like so like you know like do your architectural people end up buying some of your tin types or do your tin type clients end up hiring you to do architectural stuff like does it help your career to have these multiple things or would it be of smarter to like just do one really really well well of course it would be smarter to do one really really well it doesn't take a blind man to see that but i've always been a little bit contrary and a little i have my own agenda with things and 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 frankly, I have lost architecture jobs because people will say, well, you know, maybe you should do more of that stuff. Or, and, and you just go, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Next, you know, and then you move on. And personally, the, the two feed each other. I, I really learn things looking through a view camera that apply back to a digital camera because, you know, to me, the, the most single difficult thing in digital photography is using the crappy cameras. You know, I hate, I never liked 35 millimeter cameras in the first place. They're always too small. There's two, there's, I don't, I don't hear music when I hold one, but you know, it's just, but you have to deal with them. And that's, that's the, that's the lay of the land now. And then I use Sony cameras a lot and they're even smaller than your DSLRs and things. And uh, so I learned how to, I, I keep my vision attuned using a view camera I think sometimes I even carry a view camera on a shoot just so I can set it up and look through it to find the shot because you know eight by ten is more that's my camera that's that's where I live then when I'm working with it's kind of like driving somebody else's car with uh, you know digital cameras you know you're kind of figuring it out as you go what it does and then but but see that's that's fun too learning and, and, and getting to do the digital pictures look the way you want them to look which which is endless computer time and uh, but I, I find it difficult to break into one thing or the other. Well, and that's the thing, you know, because like I've even, so I'm an artist, but I'm also a teacher. And so like I can either become a magnificent teacher, but I, I, my, my art practice will wane because of that. Or I could focus a bit more on my art practice, but my teaching would wane because of that. So it's, I find it really hard in the, creative industries that oftentimes we have to take on multiple jobs in order to make ends meet and in doing so we end up not being able to become as masterful as of one thing and not necessarily like technically masterful but like professionally masterful like you know like I'm sure if in a perfect world if you could make the living you would love to just do historical process photography all day every day but the industry is just not there. They're not going to be paying enough for that to, to sustain <laughs> no. uh, your livelihood. No, that's not going to happen. But yeah, well, maybe it could happen. I shouldn't say not so quickly, but it, it's it's a stretch. I mean, there are people making a living doing that, but I think they're, they're, they do have a day job, whether it's teaching or I don't know anyone selling enough prints to break away and be... And they run workshops also. They run that's workshops, a lot of teaching different kinds of, you know, the workshop model is, you know, that's that's kind of the way to go. Have you been doing workshops? I do. I do uh, what I call tutorials. Like I'll have one or two students and we'll do, like I have one coming today. We're doing just black and white darkroom stuff. There's, you know, there's a big interest in that these days. Is there? Oh, kids in their 20s are shooting film like crazy. Yeah, I love it. I guess I was a little too early for that. When we're looking at your artworks, so, you know, your historical works, are people paying for it? Like how, how busy are you with that? Or do, do you book, you know, how many shoots do you book a month or what, you know, what kind of criteria can you give me? Well, I do that? my portraits, you know, and, and I, I do probably a slow month might be one or two or none, or a busy month might be 10. So it's somewhere in that range is, is pretty consistent. And, and, and that's maybe what we might call a fine art portrait shoot where it's done in a fine art way, but typically it's to fulfill the subjects and clients 
<laughs> need for a portrait. Okay, so that's interesting. So you're, you're doing these pieces that you present as fine arts, but for sake of argument, and please go ahead and argue with me on this, it's sort of, it's still commercial photography, yeah. like the way you're doing it. Yeah. Because it's a client is hiring you, you're just simply giving them the outcome in a different medium. So right. digital versus this. So so you're right. so pretty much you do, you you do a lot of commercial works but yeah. in different mediums. But then you also have your own artistic projects as well. You know, like I said I've seen the marshes and the the surfers and some other things mm -hmm. along this line. So ha have you been trying to produce exhibitions or books or anything like this? Well, I've I, I've done a lot of exhibitions. My modus operandi for many years was to have at least one exhibit a year or more and a lot of times I would have a show one place and I would have the same work I'd go show some pl other place another town or you know yep framing's not cheap yeah because you and then you know I collect a bunch of frames and then but then you know it's just gotten to where the, the print sales really are, are not that great maybe it's commentary on my prints I don't know it's just no I think it's a commentary on contemporary society like yeah. i'm not seeing like i in the past five years or so i have weighed away from printing at all um because people are perfectly fine with just looking at their screens like they don't mm -hmm. feel the need for a print as much as they used to very true like it's it's a sad state of affairs in many ways but like for me, I just, I, sh I shifted. So like now I'm doing more hand done printing. So like I print and then paint or collage or tear or whatever onto the, the mm -hmm. photographs to make it a unique, basically a painting in the end kind of thing, but using, still using photography as its starting point. Right. So, I mean, it seems like people are more interested in that kind of work than they are in digitally reproducible prints. Right. right. And, and, and that's, that's the thing. And then they don't care about, you know, you can have a beautiful platinum print or albumin or something, and they don't care. I mean, for the most part, you, you could have, you know, done, you know, carbon on glass, and they still don't care. I mean, they just don't care. If they like the image and they're inspired by it, there's something that, that intrigues them, and they decide they want it on their wall, that's cool. But but that's a that's a long stretch, you know. I mean, I, I put photos all over the place, so I, I like a lot of photos around, but not everyone's that way so well I, I also find that to a certain extent it's um it's funny like i said, just said this the other day on a, on the recording which is that sometimes the clients or the buyers or the whatever the 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 patrons of your creativity are not necessarily where you live and sometimes you have to go to wherever they are and so like to me this kinds of historical processes i could see new england freaking loving it i could see you know chicago area loving it wilmington north carolina yeah i could see it liking it but i i think that there's a people lot like of boats here <laughs> people like you know it's it's it, there's a recreational obsession here that's bordering on narcotic you know people are just obsessed with getting out in the boat and getting drunk and fishing Woo! oh and they're yeah, big, big you know? pickup trucks as well that's their thing yeah have you noticed that i have and they have really bright lights Yes, and I'm driving a smart car today, so yeah, everything's yeah, so they're, huge they're to me. Really big, yeah. You know, Wilmington is, is a nice place to live, but it, there's a different culture <laughs> than uh, art-based culture, right? And well, that's sort of my thing, and that's what I'm getting at is like, because like I lived in the Middle East, and now I live in Europe, and and I found that you know maybe the the town I live in or the country I live in, I mean, because I live in a small country even at this point, and is not the market for me, you know? And mm -hmm. in the same way, like mm -hmm. I could absolutely see like a great market for this stuff. I don't see that market being Wilmington, North Carolina, because I mean, the people here are, it's not that they're uneducated in the arts, but they're just not as appreciative of the arts and the, and the, the skill and the craftsmanship as some other parts of even just the United States would mm -hmm. certainly be. So and we have a lot of artists here. There's, I mean, there's, Right, I we mean, do have a lot, of, and it's great. Throw a rock, you'll hit an artist. But the, yeah, but they're not going <laughs> to pay for stuff. They're going to trade for stuff. They'll pay for wine, but yes, I know. I'm as guilty of it as anybody else. Yeah, know. you know, it's that's it's it's not even really a criticism. It's just kind of the way it is. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I buy smart here and there, but I, I don't buy nearly as much as I wish I could. 
Well, but that's because we're not making enough of a living to be able to afford the art that we want right. to buy because we choose to live in a place like this, or you choose to live. I don't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I still like it here. I, you know, the, the, the traffic is, there's, there's a lot of minor complaints here, but it's, meh. It's, Go to Washington, D.C., man. The traffic here is nothing. Oh, I, know. I know. I know. I've been working up there a lot lately. I've, <laughs> I've experienced it. It's horrible. Ten lanes know. of traffic. And, and all backed up. It's all insane. Backed up. You're I like, don't understand it. Wow. What? But anyways, all right. Um, okay, so as far as your tin type works and all these kinds of things, like, so how, what kind of reactions do you get? I mean, again, so like, I'm, I'm going to try and rephrase my previous question to be mm-hmm. like, do you find any difficulties of like the nature of having to, two very disparate ideas of your your style? Because like, you have this beautiful, clean, uh, you know, gorgeous architectural work that you do that's you know polished and gorgeous, and then you have these very sort of raw, old, antique feeling things. Do you ever run into any problems with like the the fact that some people know you for one and don't know you for the other, or vice versa, or anything like this? Or does it hurt your reputation to have multiple things you're known for, or help? Yeah, well, I feel like it, it should help. We all hope it will help. I mean, it's who I am. I'm sorry. I'm interested in a lot of things, so I, you, you know, and, and I'm a little bit of a nut, I guess, you know, because. There's a, I like to think, I don't know if it's spiritual or there's spirits, there's things that, there's a certain amount of clairvoyance to it. I see things, I, I try to get them in the picture. I've, you know, there's there's some peculiar things that happen. Okay, wait, slow down. You see things? Is this like I see dead people kind of you see things? Well, not or? like dead people, but I, I may see orbs or I may see, I mean, hear things and see th- traces of shadows that, I'll say to someone, hey, did you see that? And they're like, what? And I'm like, no, never mind. Okay. And it's been like that since childhood. I've always had occurrences that are okay. unexplainable. And I, I don't try to explain them. I just assume. And then when I talk to real clairvoyant people that are very attuned to their thing, they're going, oh, yeah. Or, you know, sometimes somebody will come up to me and go, wow, you're an old one. And I'll go, don't start please <laughs> no, yeah, no. You're gonna, my wife is going to be so angry if you continue on this yeah yeah so yeah i don't know so i'm a little bit of a nutcase but i but i think that's okay i embrace that kind of crazy side of myself just because it is good for fodder for imagining photographs and and making photographs and, and keeping things exciting and interesting to, my, to myself and then i hope that eventually that will translate to a project that it is a really good success. I mean, I think the the art museum thing was was pretty close to success, but being in the Civil War related is not really a popular topic. With a lot of people and a lot of people don't know how to interpret it. Uh, I mean, history, uh, you, you know, things happened that weren't weren't good, and it's not to be commemorated particularly, but but also they shouldn't be forgotten, so we don't repeat that kind of. It's kind of my philosophy with it. Kind of you know? like we are this year, but yeah, anyways. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. So I, I, I probably need to find a better subject matter. I, I enjoy the Civil War stuff in, in a, from the context of just the observer. You know, I don't, it was, it was a horrible, horrible time for everyone. I mean, there was nobody unscathed and some were worse than others. It was terrible. And hopefully that never happens again. <laughs> So. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Now, when it comes to exhibiting your artworks and, and presenting exhibitions and stuff like this, have you been writing proposals, uh, entering contests, doing grants? Like, I, What's your processes in, in trying to find these kinds of outlets? I'm thinking in terms of books. I'm thinking in terms of big projects. I'm thinking in terms of finding sponsors to, to, to fund these books. I don't really have a whole lot of faith in grants. I mean, I've applied and applied and Never get anything. I've entered con- endless contests. Never get anything. I-, I think all those avenues can be good for people, and it's worth a try. You-, you might have the lucky. You might have the golden ticket. I don't know. I don't. So I. So I'm trying a different a different approach, and and the book thing is what I'm I'm thinking in terms of. Okay, elaborate. Tell me more. I want to know. So like, so what's your idea on this? Because don't get me wrong. Every photographer, probably every artist in the world, has a book idea. So like, what's yeah. your idea of how to do it differently because of course the entire industry has changed dramatically in the past Mm -hmm. decade because you know books are less common they're not funded as well there are just aren't as many booksellers like so like 
Right. What's your idea? I know, it's another <laughs> dead end I'm approaching. <laughs> but but I think it's a better way to experience the art. It's a better way to get a great body of art. And it's a, it's a better way for the consumer to get your art at a lower price. They can have something that's the complete issue. So I love a coffee table book. I mean, yeah. I, my, I still my entire them. library is coffee table books. Yeah. Oh, I love them. I, I, in fact, people sometimes laugh when I go on an extended trip somewhere, maybe a little vacation stuff. I have a stack of coffee table books I bring to look at because I haven't had a chance to really enjoy them. Oh, I do it the other way. When I go on vacation, I buy a bunch of coffee yeah. table books and bring them back and then have to pay overage on my weight and my luggage. Yeah, that too. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah. So, so, but I, th I think the book is a great medium for photographers and you, you got to have something to sell. And that's, that's something you, I don't know. I'm still learning how to get it done. I, I mean, I have, well, what have you tried? Like, I mean, cause part of the thing that, that most of us learn from the most is, you know, mistakes, basically. Mm -hmm. Like we all learn from mistakes really, mm -hmm. really well. We don't learn from successes quite so well. Cause we're just like, yes, it's cause I'm talented and it, Oh yeah, when you don't really realize you don't... what you did right, but boy, when you do something wrong, you really learn well, what you usually, did wrong. There's beginner's luck, you know. The first one's great, and then you go to the second one, and you then you forget all the things you did right because mm -hmm. you because you, you feel like you got to try something new, you got to do something a little different, and then you you trip yourself up very easily. A good example: um, I, I did a project in 2017 with a, a vineyard out in California. They invited me out to photograph there, just kind of do a weekend shoot, come visit shoot 10 types and i'm like awesome yeah i'll do that love to and okay wait get a little more specific on this did they what did they pay for everything yes. or did, okay so like no money out of your pocket they paid for everything they got the results to use probably for what yeah. reason yeah they wanted it for advertising well you know it, it went on from there i mean you know this, these things are not always cut and dried you don't always know what's going on yeah i mean i didn't know really exactly what we we're going to shoot i was like okay well i'll just bring my stuff and we'll i'll get my stuff there i had to order and ship things and you know you can't fly with collodion along with cyanide and things like that so you find ways to ship it there and then when you get there you know you set it all up and i, I literally went to the lumber store bought some wood you know made my dark room my dark box assembled everything when I got there and went pretty well and they said well hey you know it'd be great to do a, a new extended project on the on our uh, vineyard here and I was like oh yeah let's, let's do it so I went back and photographed the harvest time and the fall it was just beautiful unfortunately that year about uh, it was about six days after I left there was a humongous fire in Santa Rosa and many people lost their homes many people lost their lives I mean it was just a horrendous year for that area that, and I think it was a bad year for the vineyard. I don't, I don't, well, not for the vineyard, but uh, for the vintage. I don't know that the smoke affected the grapes. Or I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the full thing. I'm not a full. It sounds good. I'll go with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not completely in the know of. Well, I would imagine it could cause something that, that then got into the dirt, that then got into the nutrients. And, you know, I could see it. I could see it Cause, disrupting you know, they, they were, the They were ecosystem. squashing the grapes right then. You know, they, they pick, they squash, and... and then you have all that smoke coming in while the grape is, is exposed as juice. So you're collecting that smoke. So it's probably got a little more of a smoky feel, smoky feel. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that wasn't the plan. It's great for whiskey. Probably great for whiskey. Yeah. So anyhow, so I, you know, it, I did a handmade book for them and we made a little, a little more production book that I can have uh, around and, and you know, it went okay. I, I think uh, eventually, you know, there'll be more. I keep, eyes and ears open for a land or someone that's right interested okay in that. but let's take that back a step so you just said somebody just contacted you how did that contact occur in the first place that's a good point because i always have to give a shout out to my good friend matt morris matt morris is an outstanding filmmaker he contacted me in 20 about 2011 and wanted to do a portrait with he and his uh, fiance and they came in and did we did portraits and had a great time and then Great guy to know, really enjoyed it. And then he called back a couple of days later, hey, I'd like to do a little short kind of Vimeo documentary portrait of you. And I'm like, well, sure, of course. So he came back, did a little film on me called American Tintype. It's on Vimeo. It's on your website as well. It's on my website. And it, it got a lot of play. And, and Matt was just incredibly savvy and smart the way he marketed it. He was, he was able to get it out there to lots of, I mean, I was on, uh, I mean, you you name it, man, from the Atlantic to 
Petapixel to, you know, all the little things. It was, it was out there on, on everything. And, and you know, it's, it's, I've gotten a number of portraits from it and, and some other gold jobs, but the, the, the working with the vineyard was probably the, the biggest thing. And he's, he himself is a photographer out in Sa uh, San Helena, California and in the Napa Valley and working in Napa and Sonoma counties, working for vineyards. He's, he's a wine aficionado. He's a wine maker. He's a wine lover. I mean, he's just, he, I mean, he's, that's his world. And fortunately I, I was able to hook a caboose to it and, and tag into there a little bit. I was going to say, so let me get this, so let me try and connect the dots on this. So a random person asked for a portrait from you. You did a portrait for this person. They liked you as a person and your process so much that they made a video of that. Then they were so well known in their video making that their video got picked up by all these great news outlets, which then led to being connected to the winery. Yes, and if I had tried to do that in a million years, it'd never, never work. Well, that's sort of never my point. Worked. Is what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to sort of point out to like my own brain slash the listener is basically like, you never know what things are going to happen. Like some, you know, just like one random thing could end up leading down a path that you never could have foreseen. And so, like, you know, it's like my teachers used to, my teachers used to always say, when a, when somebody comes and asks you to do a photograph, the answer is always yes, and then you figure out how to do it. Right. Uh, and I have that approach with everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you never really want to negate anything because it, it's, you just don't know what's coming. But I, I hear a lot of people these days saying no to things like, oh, that's not my style. Oh, that's not what I do. You know, like people say no a lot more than I remember them saying no. Yeah, that's true. I've, I've heard a lot of people and you know, that's fine. That's you know, I might be the next person they call when they get someone gets a no, they might call me next. So I, I'm glad I welcome I welcome all comers. I, I do photography in many genres. So as long as their cash is green, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, because like there's another photographer I know who I'm not going to say their name, but another photographer I know that he he's a professional photographer. He does a very good job. No knock on it. One day we were out talking and I, I said, oh, hey, I could, could you do a little portrait of me? He's like, yeah, that'll be one hundred and fifty dollars. I was like, I just you're a photographer like and i'm a peer like can't you just help me out to do a quick portrait <laughs> yeah and he's like oh no i don't pick up my camera without being paid like and he just refused he just get out of bed without getting paid that's correct like he hey, will not take pictures unless there's money involved in it and for me as the, the pure sort of creative artist person i was like what the fuck is wrong with you like what a like like capitalistic like <laughs> like arrogant thing for him to say but 20 years later now going on i totally get it yeah, yeah i totally understand well, you that. got i mean i had three kids you know you gotta you gotta feed people you gotta pay your bills you you, you, you know it would, it would be nice if my bills were paid and i could just do my art and just give it away i, I mean no you, no you should never give it away people should still no. say that they should value it by giving you right. something so like, exactly. that's just don't gift that's exactly. ridiculous yeah. But actually, you just brought up the fact that you have children. Um, I often have this conversation with female artists and art people in the art world, but I also want to, the male side of this is, now how old's your oldest? 19. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> how does or did the having children affect your working career? So whether it be the commercial work or the fine artwork, like how did it affect it? Because I'm sure it changed your thought pattern, your mindset, like, I would imagine pre kid, you were like, yeah, I'll do that thing for cheap. But like after kid, you're like, no, I got bills to pay. <laughs> you're like, you got to pay me full price. Yeah. And you, and you don't s quite say it that way. You know, you kind of, you want to, you want to maneuver the conversation in such a way that my they, kid they needs braces. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you've, and I've, I've had two kids with braces and, and I, and I have three kids. So it's, it's a, yeah, it becomes more serious. I, I had a I had a window of time where where my father died. I finally decided, well, you know, it's, I should get married. It's, marriage is a good thing. And I'm not gonna have a family one day cause if I don't get married because everybody's gonna be dead. Give me a little clarifications. How old are you right now? I'm 55. Really? Yeah. Okay. You look great. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, and and so, how old were you when this your father I was died? About Thirty five okay four so continue three, on with somewhere your in there yeah so 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 life i kind of grew up you know i think i had about from from about 15 to 35 i was probably just summer vacation you know in my mind you know i was like anything i could do to 
do nothing in a way, you know. Uh, then then became more serious, and and I, I've I've always probably been a touch late in getting serious about things. So it definitely makes you more serious. It makes you you, you know realize that work is not everything. You know, when you're a photographer, you're you're kind of married to being that, and, and any kind of work for an artist, you know, when your your identity and your work and your ego and your self esteem and all that stuff is intertwined, it's it's not easy. I mean, you, nobody tells you how to be a photographer. There's really no, I mean, there might be somebody to give you a tutorial today or you can watch YouTube. Yeah. So, so kids, you know, it, you, you discover how self-centered you are. That's, that's a big, you know, it's flat out, you know, you're, you're married to your work, your, your ego's there, your self-esteem's there, your, you know, it's, it's, it's your, it's where you go peacock mode, you know, it's your thing, you know, and once you have kids, kids, you know, you're holding that baby. That baby doesn't care who you are, uh, what you do, other than you love that baby. So that's so. So you, you it opens up a whole nother world, and I think for an artist, it can be great inspiration of different work to do, different things to do. I haven't really used my kids in artwork that much. Occasionally, I'll have them do something, but they kind of run from me when they see the big camera come out. As most parents who are photographers or artists in general, their children do at a certain age, you know. But then they'll, they'll appreciate it later. Yeah, I think so. I, I like I like them to think that I was attempting to do something, and I I, I think they're seeing. I, I hear comments now and again from them that they 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 do have somewhat of an understanding of what what I'm about and what I've been trying to do, and they see that in positive. I, I guess it probably makes them want to go get a job, but. <laughs> I don't a, jo- know. a job that has health care and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can live kind of a normal life, have a new car, all that stuff. Okay, wait. So speaking of like normal life kind of thing, this is also something that like my wife is an accountant. Okay, so like she goes to work, she comes home. Nobody judges her as being an accountant, uh, you know, outgoing social and stuff. But like us as creative people, when we go anywhere, we're always working. You know, so like you could go to the grocery store and you might run into somebody who runs an art gallery or you might go to the bar and run into a book publisher. Like literally we're always sort of on like like we're always being judged and and our whole reputation is built not only on our like professional experiences, but like how we're perceived as people on a day to day basis. Mm-hmm. And that I at one point in my career, I found that very disturbing like i mean because because i suddenly realized like every time i walk out of the house my career is being judged on how, whether i'm a nice person or a good person or a kind person in any situation because i mean like in yours at working as the gig economy working on just like client by client thing you literally can walk in and find a client anywhere you go and so you kind of always have to be on and that's difficult I, I think, yeah, I think you don't even realize how difficult it is. After you've been doing it a long time, you just, maybe you go out of town and you forget to take a camera and you for, you just kind of, you know, weekend away with the misses. And it's really refreshing when you're kind of out of yourself that way. And it's, that's, and it's hard to get out of yourself. And I think children help you get out of yourself in many ways. And, and, and it even helps you get back to a more centered part of yourself as well. So... So, so it's definitely a big impact. And then it also the charging and what to charge, what not to charge for. I, I think as a photographer, you're, you're, when you have kids, the, I mean, I, my success has almost come in spite of myself. You know, so I, if, if, if I raise the prices across the board, last time I did that was like 2008. And, you know, Lehman Brothers crashed and the whole world went to hell. And it, I didn't have any work <laughs> for 2009 and 10. So I don't know. So it's it's hard to, uh, you know, I, I didn't take the business classes, so I don't, I don't, so I kind of wing it. I was just editing a podcast this morning about uh, the fact that basically we're not, you know, as creative people, when we go to school and get educated on being creative, we're taught the techniques and the craftsmanship and all this kind of stuff, but we're none, we're never given business, like how to so do it true. for a living. And that's a huge weakness in the American educational well, system. I, you know, I, I tell young artists, you know, take your accounting classes, take a two-year business, get, get a two-year business degree. Don't worry about studying art. You, the art will come. If you're, if you're inspired and, it's, and that, that fire is there, you, you will learn what you need to learn. You can take workshops. 
find a good mentor. These days, YouTube videos, I mean, with the, the millions of ones out there, you can probably find what you want to learn. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've taught myself many things about how to fix things on my car. <laughs> you know, you know, taking workshops is a really great way to do it. Penland was, for me, very instrumental in, in my life, very pivotal in my life. The two-week workshop, you know, you, you pretty much have a semester of growth in two weeks. I mean, oh, yeah. Penland's amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Totally random topic, actually. Mm-hmm. I've been keep, keep, keeping notes, something I forgot to ask you about. Uh, the name Fly, where does that come from? I was judged by my peers to be a a flyweight, whereas in the 80s they'd call somebody who was a novice partier. They, you would be a lightweight. A lightweight. Yeah. yeah. And then, but I was a flyweight, even low. And then the guy said, yeah, fly. And it stuck. That's and, it. Huh? And then I think I fell off a lifeguard stand or something about that time. So it was, it was all kind of first night at UNCW kind of situation. I know. Yeah. I mean, I've known many people with stuck. those kinds of nicknames. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's difficult to shake those. All right. Back to teaching. So you were talking about workshops and taking workshops. Now I know from conversations with you over the de- decades that you, you have always wanted to teach and there's always been this barrier, which academia has sort of put in your place, which is very mm-hmm. unfortunate, which is generally universities and colleges have to require a master's degree, at least in the studio arts. And you don't have that. You have right. batch BFA? Uh, BFA. BFA. Yeah. And I've, you know, if, if, you, could, if you could backpedal, I, I have done probably five or six different processes where I have taught myself how to do, you know, I pretty much taught myself to do wet plate collodion. I started with the silver sunbeam and then realized I needed to find something more modern. And I found John Coffer's book and, and pretty much taught myself to do it. And then I enjoyed the book so well. I was like, well, I need to go meet John Coffer. So I went, did a workshop at his place and, and kind of got tightened up. And then I've, I've been working along ever since, and, you know, salt printing, albumin printing, taught those myself. Uh, I don't know. Then digital photography came along. I mean, I was trained in film and, and black and white darkroom was what my college was about. And suddenly five years out where all bets are off, we're now switching gears to digital. So I, I learned that, you know, and I, I, I'm learning video pretty rapidly right now. And so I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think I could certainly qualify for a master's degree. I've, I've done the work. Well, that's sort of my point is, is like, because like I went, where I went to school, I went to school at University of Iowa, which of course they would require a master's degree to teach there or a PhD, depending on the discipline. But I also went to a private school, Corcoran. And at the Corcoran, like I had a teacher that didn't even have a high school diploma, but because of his skills and his reputation and his his career, he had the the sort of real world equivalency yeah. that mm-hmm. allowed for him to teach. And you know, how do you feel about that? I guess is sort of my thing because like I don't think the whole like need a master's is a smart way to go because like you like I'll give you here I'll give you like my little soapbox on this for you. You have real world experience, whereas an academic such as myself, so I'm going to put myself down, I don't have the real world experience. I don't know how to actually make a living doing all this kind of stuff. So like to a certain extent, you would be a much better teacher because you could say, oh, yeah, okay, when you're doing this, be sure to factor in taxes and lawyer fees and all these other things. Oh, that's right. That yeah. like, if I, tra- I'm I charge teaching, sales tax on my art. Yeah. Yeah. But like I wouldn't know to hours. say that. To somebody, I'd be like, "Yeah, just you know, how, however it feels like a good price, <laughs> yeah, right. you know." But like, but you know about like liability insurance and you know property oh, yes. insurance and all these kinds of things. The the real world situations that most academics, and I'm making fun of myself in this case, we are unaware of and or don't teach people. Yeah. yeah so like, I feel like you'd be a great teacher. Well, it's, it's very important for the artist to 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 tell. The consumer, what what's your what's your overhead? A little bit about your overhead, you know. I mean, I you know, I have three kids. I have a mortgage. I have the I computers, have to pay for. the hard drives, the oh, software yeah. prices. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's the amount insane. Back end stuff that we have to pay for that other people don't think they have to pay right. for when they hire us. Right. They I think mean, it's just a digital camera. Just yeah. just Adobe Suites. My God, Adobe Suites is so expensive these days. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, it is tricky. I you know I've taught. Last couple of years, I've, I've taught a basic SLR intro class at the community college, and 
I think as a teacher, I've gotten better at it. The last go around, I think I did pretty good. But, you know, I still have half the class drop out because they don't know what I'm talking about. But it really becomes more about a general photography and philosophy of photography. I, do, I, mean, I, I love it when people drop out of class. It's kind of humorous to me. There's even a class to teach a DSLR. I mean, yeah. what, you you don't have YouTube? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> you have the, a phone. They do, no, they need to do it because they, they have to take an elective credit and they think it will be easy to take that because they already know how to yeah. do it. Well, mine's they continuing ed, so I get, you know, people that might have a business and they want to learn how to take better pictures for their business or... Oh, when I did it here in town, most of my people that I taught photography to were new parents that want to be able to take pictures <laughs> yeah. of their kids. Yeah, and that's they bought the, this camera. That's right. And no they, idea what to do. Or they were gifted a camera and they don't know how to use it, kind of thing. Yeah. Like, very common. And it, But it's a lovely start. I think it's great. Yeah. You know, it's, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I usually have to give them a few assignments and they get off and running and, and I guess they assume they don't need me anymore and they don't come back. But, and then I'll have people that come in every week and sit right there and they're, they're, they're loving my slideshows. They're loving my discussions about things. And so, yeah, you know, it's, I, well, but the nice, I don't know if I'm a good teacher or not. But well, I'm, the nice thing about those kinds of classes actually is you're paid the same, whether it's 20 students or 10 students. Right. So, like, so it, it doesn't really matter. It's, to a certain extent, it's more about the quality of the education than it is the quantity. So it's not about mm -hmm. do, teaching a lot of people as much right. as the people who are there really get a really great education. Yeah, and the other important thing is, I learned that right away, is uh, don't read the reviews. <laughs> they will slam you <laughs> over nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, get I, I'd never do that again. I have a very low rating. I don't even know why them. they ask for reviews. I don't even want to know. <laughs> uh, they, it's it's a federal <laughs> mandate is what it is. Ah, okay. they, yeah, they have to do it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, like I'm, I've looked on ratemyprofessor.com for me, and it's I, it's I'm like a two and a half out of five. It's really bad. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's fine. That's the way it goes. Yeah, I'm That's not too A famous UNCW it. professor told me not to ever read the reviews. Well, legally, you're supposed to read the reviews, but yeah, you can't kind of take it to heart. Like I had, yeah, a, actually, that's right. I had a job recently that I was teaching at this university, and my dean actually came to me and said, "Oh, we read the student feedback, and you know they're not really very happy. Uh, <laughs> we're we're not gonna we're not gonna have you back next semester. Oh no, because the students don't like your class." And I, I'm and I was just like, "I'm sorry, who the fuck cares whether they like my class?" did they learn anything in my class? And then he's like, oh yeah, no, they learned a lot. They're very knowledgeable and they feel very skilled with the knowledge that, that you've given them, but they didn't like it. And, and I was like, since when is academia about liking a class? Oh, the world is about feelings nowadays. Everybody, I know. Everybody's feelings are so important. Well, this is why I'm doing a podcast instead of <laughs> going back to <laughs> academia immediately. I hope to get back to academia someday, but... No, you might need your I, own school. You I wanted need... to settle down a little bit. I feel like it's going a bit too far in one direction or another, mm -hmm. and uh, let it come to some good balance. Well, I know a lot of a lot of people in academia are looking at the door. You know, they're because they're they're not getting paid anymore. They're getting paid less and asked to do more. And I recently spoke to a guy who no had advancement. tenure. No, I knew a guy who had tenure, and he left. He's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want yeah. to be. Because even once they're tenured, they're giving them more obligations and making them do more administrative stuff, which is not why people become teachers. Mm -hmm. Like, I have this perfect belief that I, I wish that there could be almost like two criteria of teachers. There are teachers who like committee meetings and doing paperwork, and that's one kind yeah, of I teacher. Yeah, I don't do meetings. No, yeah, I'm not and a another kind guy. of teacher that loves being in the classroom. And, and so the classroom teacher doesn't have to do committee stuff and the committee person does less classroom stuff but and does all the committee works. Like, if I could be in a classroom teaching, you know, six hours a day, five days a week, I would be very happy with that. And no committees, no mm -hmm. meetings, none of that stuff. But yeah. just teaching would mm -hmm. be ecstatic. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not the way of academia these days. Yeah. No. No workshops your own your own university I, th I almost feel like there needs to be and you know they're they're, they're restarting black mountain college <gasps> no well somebody has copyrighted the name so you can't use that name but they're in black mountain north carolina they're the college of the uh, alternative i love black which mountain i love college. the sound of that yeah that's right up alternative your to what Literally. i don't know alternative to great throwback getting a degree i guess because because you know somebody just i know so many successful people that 
never got a degree. And Absolutely. Then, and then nobody's ever even asked to see my degree, which yeah. I would be floored if anybody asked to see it. It's a, it's a thing that, like, I was in Abu Dhabi, and our students like, were obsessively fixated on grades, 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 grades. And I'm like, nobody is ever going to give a shit about what your grades were. All they care about is your portfolio. You make good work or you don't make good work. That's it. Yeah. School's not the Super Bowl. No. Yeah. There's no win or loss. It's just a way to get a piece of paper Maybe so you can just say something. something. Okay, sure. There are certain disciplines Medical. where higher education is perfectly appropriate and if not necessary. Yeah. The arts is not one of them. Yeah. I definitely say, kids, get your get your business degree first. I go with associates in business. Yeah, and then a, and then go on to start. like get like your a, mindset right. Yeah, yeah. And, I and, totally agree. And, and don't you know my philosophy too has been to to do what I have to do in photography to pay the bills, and it's it's not a cop out or a sellout. It's because you know the grants, all these things, they're subjective to opinion and this and that, and and you know you just. There's no guarantee you'll get anything. You know, some people get grants every time there's an opening, but they're good at it, I guess. I don't know. I've never been good at it, so I, I feel like just do the work, keep progressing. And then if you don't have enough money to do a project, do just do part of it. Don't you know, do take a step in that direction and maybe you'll you'll meet somebody that will find interest and help you along. It's it's just have faith, don't keep moving. <laughs> Now, along that you said we were talking about paying the bills and all that kind of stuff, like you don't have to answer this question, so I can edit this out if you're not comfortable with this. Like, so do you make enough to support your family, or is it a you have income, your wife has income? Like, is how well the way our family works, you know, we, we've my wife is back working. She works uh, at Tidal Creek Co-op and love it, great place. She enjoys it. It's in her field of health and beauty. I mean, she's really into um, supplements and things like that. Health. She's very health conscious. Oh, we need to talk off air. Okay, go on. Yeah. And and so that's that's a perfect place for her. I don't what the future holds for her there. I don't know what she I don't know what her what she might want to do eventually. Uh, so that so that helps. It's not a great income, obviously. And then then b me being a photographer, it's it's not, you know, I don't it's not what it used to be it used to be Photographers had a really good, between copyrights and stock photography and different things, there used to be a, almost like a blueprint of, you know, buying some real estate, you get your, get a, a good stock photography cushion going where you get a monthly check, you, and eventually you have that real estate you can sell. Well, not only that, but in the old days, you could buy a camera, and if you treated that camera well, you could literally own it your whole career. But now we have to right. upgrade equipment and software and computers right. and digital cameras all the time. Like the only, even the lenses get out of date. Like, I mean, everything you have to keep upgrading. Whereas back then, like, you could buy one amazing Hasselblad. Great Hasselblad. And use it for your whole career. Yeah. And that's all you really need. Well, but not anymore. Not anymore. No, you got to change cameras every, and then yeah, yeah. And I'm finding out my lenses from the the '90s, my film lenses that used to be really great on digital cameras, now they're soft. Yeah, they're, they're not good enough on the newer cameras. So then it's 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 super irritating. They found a way to <laughs> milk photographers, keep us down. You know? Absolutely, they have. Yeah, I mean it's capital. So that's kind of my relation. Why I got really got into wet plate. You know they. You know, boardroom decided to quit making Type 55 Polaroid, and that was my my film. That was my number one film for years and years. And when that went away, I was like, "Wow, this is this sucks." <laughs> so what do we do? So th that was another thing with the wet plate. It was like, "Well, this you just buy the raw chemicals, you you follow a formula, you make your own thing, and no more corporate boardrooms." You know, I'm I'm really immune from worrying about if you know, Polaroid's going to stop making my film or, or Kodak's going to disappear or Elford's going to disappear. Which actually lends to a question that I have written down here, which is where did you find to buy all your chemicals? Because, you know, there are, oh, yeah. there's, there's a, Bostick um, and Sullivan and there's a bunch of other brands. Yeah, and stuff like yeah you can buy, there's, there's, you can buy things pre-mixed now. You can. Well, no, but what, what do you do? What's your, what's your method? Typically I, I mix all mine raw. Okay. And that's just because it's it's a whole lot cheaper. There's a guy in California, UV Photographics. He's making some great ready-made products. And I, I've bought some his stuff. It works great. It's really good. Uh, Bostick & Sullivan has great stuff. Uh, you can buy the raw chemicals also. Artcraft up in New York State has been my source for most everything. 
Okay. And, I've never heard of them. And they're, you know, any kind of alternative process, uh, historic process, he's got the chemistry for it. So, Good prices, raw chemistry. Lovely. Okay. Last little bit to so wrap, try and wrap this up. Um, any advice other, other than advice you've already given? For, <laughs> don't repeat yourself. Any advice for sort of up and coming people at this point? So like somebody new, let's say, coming out of high school or out yeah, of college. Yeah, sure. I, I got a great thing. I, You're I mean, a teacher. I, Come on. I, I think you will get bad advice in education. And I, I did. I, there were people that I was taking a wood shop class at East Carolina, wood design, which, you know, I love woodworking. I, I, I'm always sawing on stuff to this day. But, but I got the idea I wanted to build a view camera, and they totally discouraged me from doing that. And the way my brain thinks, I could have very artistically built a really nice camera that I could reproduce. I mean, if I think back, I could have gone into the business of building view cameras. Sure. Now, this day and age, that would be a very limited calling. But there, but there, but there would have been a, a good ten years or so. By the same token, I, at the same in the same class, I learned about Penland. I overheard the teacher talking about it, and I went over and stuck my ear up, and I was like, "Oh, give me that catalog. I want to go. I'll sign up right now." He was trying to convince somebody else to go. I'm like, "No, no, no. Here, here I'm, I'm in. I'll mm-hmm. go." And and I went. It was awesome, life changing. So the, you'll get good and bad in college, but but it's very important to hear your own voice most of all, uh, and. When you have an, a real good idea, you know, write these things down and, and ex- explore them, you know, think them through. I mean, because there's, there's a lot you can do. There's, there's you, know, you know, things have been done, but there's a lot to do. And the sky's the limit. You, you, you're, you're, most people don't realize this, but they're only limited by their own minds. I mean, you know, I think, I think our country allows people to be anything and do anything. I, I really do. It's very funny you say that because my wife is Czech. So mm-hmm. she's, you know, born and raised there and uh, we have this debate because America very much has that perspective you can be anything shoot for the stars be the best in her culture in the Czech culture now maybe it's changed but like when she was growing up uh, they were very you know just get a job and just be humble and and don't rock the boat and don't try to aspire for anything more than is necessary to be happy and that's it and stop there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those people look to America and they're like, oh, you all are so arrogant that you think you can do anything. <laughs> like It's a very interesting perspective because yeah. I grew up exactly like you. We can do anything, shoot for the stars, all this. But that's not true all around the world. Like no, a lot of cultures no. are not raised that way. Look at France. France, you're, you're, you know, by third grade, you know if you're going to be a, a doctor or you're going to be a bricklayer. Yeah. When, and when the sad in- fact is the doctor is only going to get about 20 bucks more an hour. Yeah. I know. You know, bricklayers are very you know, well paid. Yeah. And you're going to be paying 75% taxes. Let that number soak into your head. It's not that's quite right. But okay. That's, that's brutal. Well, I mean, it's it's just an interesting lovely thing. country, but like, nice place to visit. But it, in the Czech Republic, when they're in, I think eighth or ninth grade, they have to choose their yep. career path. Basically, like right there, they can go to technical school or engineering schools or whatever. Like they have to choose in eighth grade. I would never, if I had chosen what I wanted to do in eighth grade, I probably would have been like a superhero. I mean, like I didn't have a job or a career. Yeah, I would be a pro grade. skateboarder in eighth grade. Well, yeah, yeah. Good luck on that. Yeah. Eighth grade. What would I? What, eighth grade. No, actually, I probably would have been a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I probably would have been thrown in prison by now <laughs> for some stupid shit. But anyway, yeah. But it, yeah, it's very interesting because I mean that that aspirational goal of a, like we can do anything that our mind you know lets us do is not a worldwide thing. And right, as an American, I thought that's it was why a everybody wants thing. to come here. I mean, because there there is a legitimate opportunity. You, I disagree with that. My wife does not want to come to America. And I keep telling people, I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I married a European uh, citizen so that I could be in Europe, not, not the other <laughs> yeah. way around. Like, she didn't marry me for a green card. I uh, married her so I could work in Europe. Because <laughs> yeah, every, every American creative well, person. Too, not, man. Yeah, well, every American you creative Europe. person wants to be in Europe because, like, yeah. it's the, the history and the, you know, oh, all yeah. the, the stuff with art. I would like to be in Europe. Spain. I love Spain. See, there you go. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, yeah. all American creative people people want to be in Europe. So yeah. I didn't, she didn't marry me for a green card. I married her so I can get to Europe. <laughs> yeah. 
So I don't know. It, it's it's there's no. I'm I'm bad at generalizing. So oh, don't get me wrong. I do admit. it all the time. I've made a complete ass out of myself many times on this podcast. <laughs> uh, one just came out the other day where I did with Rhonda Bellamy where we were talking about racism. She oh. did really well with it. I looked like an idiot, but it's fine. Yeah, uh, it's a that's a that's a, that's a tough topic. <laughs> well. It's topics that need to be talked about. That's true. And so true. You know, what better person to talk to than the person who created the Black Arts Alliance and oh, yeah. the, the yeah. Black mm-hmm. Film Festival and all this other kind of stuff. She's the perfect person to talk and, to and, here. And Rhonda is, I mean, she's probably the most eloquent speaker I personally know. She did very well. Like I tried to push her into giving me like more blunt and crass answers, and she was very good with no, you know, she's keeping her composure. She's, she's, she's good and generally a nice person, too. Oh, she, yeah. I really enjoy her. I'm totally going to edit all that part out, by the way. But, <laughs> um, that's sort of the fun of being the person in control. I can choose yeah. what I don't want, <laughs> don't yeah. want in there. I don't but, think I've said anything particularly stupid. No, you've done fine. No, no, no. Uh, I think I've said some stupid things, but you've done lovely. Well. Um, last thing is there any topic that you want to that i haven't asked you about that you'd like to talk about um or something that you didn't get to elaborate on enough that you want to flesh out well i, I don't know i i i, I think we covered it uh, and the big things that it, i guess i would suggest p- for people to take away is to you know listen listen to your voices and those those weird little ideas you get are, are your most valuable gold so Figure those things out and go with them and explore, 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 explore. Be interested. Be an interesting person. Yeah. Boring is just, well, boring. Yeah. It's time for that. But my parents have a great card on their refrigerator that says being normal is exhausting. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. I I like like that. And so I grew up around that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Hey, Matt. Good to see you, man. Thanks. You too. Ciao.